Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We're grateful for the presence of everyone. If we have any visitors, we want you to know that you're our most welcome guest. We certainly hope that you'll come back and be with us again anytime you have opportunity. If you do see anything or hear anything in this assembly that you don't understand, bring that to our attention. We'd be happy to discuss it with you. We put a premium on the Bible in this place. We open it up. We study it. It's our textbook. And so if you have a Bible question, uh, we'll be glad to search that Bible with you and find the answer. God has the answer. We may not know, but God knows, and His Word is our perfect guide. So thank you so much for coming. The book of Acts has been called a lot of things over the years. With some, it's a story of conversions, and there's certainly no doubt about that. You got from Pentecost right on out to the uh, time Paul is in Roman prison, uh, you have a number of conversions there. There's a lot of lessons that can be learned about what we must do to be saved. And so it is indeed a book of conversions. To others, it's a book of history, the history of the early church. Uh, and, of course, that's true as well. It, uh, from the founding of the church in Acts 2, right on up until the time Paul winds up in a Roman prison once again, you have the history of the church unfolded from town to town to town. And then for others, uh, there are some other lessons that can be found. And one of those lessons we're going to talk about this morning, and that's growing a church. Church growth. Let's think about that idea for just a second. That's a topic of interest to a lot of preachers. It's a topic of interest to elders. Uh, a topic of interest should be to every member of the congregation, especially today as we witness the decline of so many churches. I've seen churches just dwindle away and little by little and one dies and another dies and another leaves and another moves on and, and soon there's nothing left. Uh, and we see young people sometimes getting frustrated and leaving the church. And so our text today that we're going to be looking at, I think, provides a kind of a neat little outline, uh, some scriptural insights about what it takes to have growth in a congregation. And I refer uh, to numerical growth as well as spiritual growth, uh, but some things that are worthy of consideration in this test. God has a recipe for church growth. I'm sure there are other things that we could talk about, but this text certainly has enough to consume our time for the next few minutes. And so let's just dig in here and think about that. Uh, the, the verse says, Acts 9 verse 31, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. We're interested in that multiplied part, you see. We're wanting to see the church grow. How does the church grow? How does it multiply? And I think in this text we see several things. Number one, it says the churches had peace. And so I'm just going to call that harmony on my outline there, peace or harmony. And I think in the context here of the book of Acts, he's actually talking about the peace they had because they're no longer be per being persecuted by Saul. Let's go all the way back here to verses 1 through 6. And remember that in this context, Saul had been persecuting the church. Uh, we don't know how long this went on, a year or two, maybe three years it went on. But it says, verse 1, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This guy's been deputized by the high priest to go to a foreign country. Damascus is in Syria. It's not in Israel. It's in Syria. And so he's going to a foreign country, to a foreign city. He's been deputized by the high priest because Jews were all over the empire. And so he carries these letters of, of his authority to go there and to bring back Christians. Notice that. Any who were of the way. That's the way of Christ. Remember Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the way. And so he's talking about Christianity here. Paul hates Christianity. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates the church. And he wants to see it wiped off the map. And so he's going to bring them bound to Jerusalem, tied up in chains to stand trial for the awful crime of being a Christian. Verse 3 says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. I imagine about this time, Paul feels pretty bad. Because he, as I said, was on a mission to destroy Jesus and the church, and he comes face to face with Jesus. And he realizes that Jesus is the Son of God, 
that he's not a fraud, that he has been raised from the dead. And so Paul is now having a change of heart. What do you want me to do? And he said, well, go into Damascus. Well, Paul goes into Damascus, and he is told what he must do. And that brings us down to verse 17 and 18. Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. You know, Jesus himself said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, Saul believes. That's why he said, What do you want me to do, Lord? I know you're the Lord now. I know you're the Son of God. And when he got there, he was told to be baptized. And so he's baptized. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Paul now not persecuting the church anymore. He's not persecuting the church anymore. And so... They have peace. They have harmony, you see. And, and they don't have to worry about looking over their shoulder and wondering if Saul is going to be coming in, breaking through the doors, and hauling them off to prison. But I also think that it suggests another kind of peace that they had. I think that they had peace with one another. And I think that's more what we want to focus on this morning. They had peace with one another. They weren't fighting with one another. You know, you, every church you go into, if you go and visit another congregation, every church has its own personality. Have you ever noticed that? And some churches you go in, everybody, they just meet you at the door, and they're happy, and they're smiling, and they greet you, and they welcome you, glad you're here. And in other churches, when you walk in, they turn around and look at you like, what in the world are you doing here? You ever been to churches like that? You can just feel the difference. It's a totally different experience. And they just look at you like you're some kind of weirdo. You don't belong here. You're not a member here. What are you doing here? And so there's a difference in attitude. And one of the reasons you have that is because those brethren don't have any peace. They're fussing with one another. And so they're, they're not interested in new people coming in. They're not interested in visitors, you see, because they're busy fighting with each other. But this church didn't have that. These churches, in fact, I said this church, notice this church is, verse 31, churches throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria, it's, it's three districts there, a number of congregations, and they all had the same experience, you see. They have peace with one another. They're not fighting with each other. And that's one of the worst things you can have with brothers and sisters in Christ, members of the family of God fighting with one another. That's not going to pr pr promote growth. Nobody's going to want to be a part of a church like that if brethren can't get along. And also the idea of peace, they're not pressing their personal opinions. You know, opinions are a lot like noses. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one. But sometimes in a church, we feel like we've got to push our opinions on everybody else. And everybody's got to see everything my way, and we all got to, we all got to toe the line with me, you see. And so we're pushing our personal opinions instead of standing for the truth, and there's no peace. You can't have peace like that because this guy over here's got one opinion, and that guy over there's got another opinion, and, and uh, the guy sitting over there got still another one, and you can't have peace like that. And a local church cannot grow. A local church cannot grow numerically, and it cannot grow spiritually if the members can't get along with one another. What a great lesson for churches to learn all throughout the land. And I want you to think about some scriptures on the importance of peace as we think about this. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember, Paul's writing to a church here that has a number of issues. They're not getting along for a number of reasons in 1 Corinthians. And one of the reasons they're not getting along is they have a bad case of preacheritis. You know, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. So, and it seems like when you read the first chapter, it kind of centers on the guy who baptized them. You know, that's my guy because he baptized me. And they couldn't get along with each other just because of their, they disagreed about their favorite preacher. Now, in that context, uh, verse 10, Paul says, Now I plead with you, brethren. Now stop right there and take notice of that word plead. The old King James, I think it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren. Uh, but the idea is I'm on my knees. I'm begging I'm begging for this. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be two divisions. No. That there be four divisions. No. He says that there be no divisions among you. Harmony. We can't have division. We can't have people not getting along. We can't have people uh, separated into different groups, you see. We can't have that but that you all be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Can't have that. 
If you want a church to grow, you can't have contentions. You've got to have harmony. You've got to have peace. You've got to have the absence of conflict, the absence of strife. You've got to have brothers and sisters willing to get along, willing to forgive. You know, we always rub one another the wrong way, even when we don't intend it. Sometimes we'll rub somebody the wrong way by something we've said or some look we had in our face, and we have to learn to forgive and forbear, you see, and not, and not be slighted by every little thing or feel slighted by every little thing that happens to us. Turn now, if you will, to James chapter 3, another passage that focuses on peace. Down toward the end of the chapter, James 3, we're going to pick up the reading about verse 16. And notice some things James says here, verse 16. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing will be there. Now just stop right there just a second and pay close attention to that. Envy, that's jealousy. Sometimes brethren get jealous of one another. They get jealous of the talents of someone. Well, that guy is a better song leader than me, or that guy's a better preacher than me, or that guy leads a better prayer than me, or whatever it is. Whatever the issue is. But there's jealousy. He said, can't have that. Where there's jealousy and self-seeking, self-seeking means all about me. My way, what I want, what I like, what I think. It's my way or the highway, you see. And, and he says, you can't have that. If you've got jealousy and you've got that idea of me first, and there's about 50 me's here, <laughs> that's not going to work. We're all going to be pulling in a different direction. He said there's going to be confusion and every evil thing. That's not good. You can't grow a congregation like that. He says, but the wisdom that's from above, wisdom from heaven, wisdom from God, is first pure, doctrinally pure, morally pure. You've got to be both. You've got to live the life. You've got to walk the walk. First pure, then, look at there, peaceable. Right there, number two on the list. Number one is purity. Let's have the doctrinal purity, but let's also have the harmony. It's peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Now, you know what that means? That means I don't have to have my own way. That's what willing to yield means. I don't have to get my own way. I'm willing to yield. I'm willing to bow to your uh, viewpoint. And so willing to yield. Full of mercy and good fruits. Without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Oh, there's that word again. Peace. Harmony, you see. It's sown in peace by those who make peace. And there are peacemakers and there are war makers. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. He never said blessed are the war makers. He said blessed are the peacemakers. So you've got to have harmony in a congregation. Let's bring in another verse here in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter's talking about living a good Christian life. He's actually quoting from the Old Testament. But in 1 Peter 3 and verse 10 for he who would love life and see good days, just let that just stop right there. You want to have a good life. You want to love your life. You want to have good days, happy days. He who would love life and, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Shut your mouth, in other words. Watch what you say. And his lips from speaking to see. Let him turn away from evil and do good. And here it is. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Go after it. Chase it. It's a goal. It's something to run for. And so run toward peace. Run for peace. Chase peace. Harmony. If you want a church to grow, you got to have that. And believe me, when visitors come in, I kind of said that at the beginning of these remarks, when visitors come in, they can see it. They can sense it. They can feel it. They know whether you're getting along with each other or not. They know that. Within five minutes of their coming in the door, they know whether this is a group of people that gets along or whether it's a group of people that doesn't get along. They sense that, you see. Well, let's go back to our text in Acts 9 and let's notice something else. It says, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified. There's a second thing. Now remember, what I'm giving you here is God's recipe. This is right out of the Bible. It's God's recipe for growth. And he said they had peace, that's harmony, and they were edified. The word edify, I find it to be a fascinating word in the Bible. Literally, it means to build up. And it has to do with, it's a construction word. And so some of you folks who are in the construction business, you kind of know what I'm talking about. They'll talk about a building, and they call it an edifice. That's, what they, that's a fancy word for a building. A building is an edifice, you see, something that has been built up. And so that's what it literally means, build to build a building. But in the scripture, it's applied metaphorically. And it's not talking about building a building, not talking about putting up a church building, but building up believers. 
It's the same concept. It's building something up, making it big and strong and, and making it what it ought to be and the, making it look the way it ought to look. But you're not talking about building a building. You're talking about building people, you see. And that's the kind of edification he's talking about here, building up believers. Now, an interesting thing in the Bible, first of all in this text and in another passage I'm going to show you, but those two things are related. Did you know that? Harmony and edification are related. They go hand in hand. And you see it in the text. He said they had peace and were edified. The word and links those two things together. And so they had peace and they were edified. They're linked. But here's another passage where those two things are linked. Turn over to Romans 14. And I think it's verse 19 is the one I'm looking for. Romans 14 and verse 19 and these brethren were actually being troubled by opinions. <laughs> and we talked about that earlier, about everybody having an opinion. These people were being troubled by opinions. And he says in verse 19, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace. Stop. And we just read that in the book of James. Pursue peace, or maybe it was Peter, 1 Peter 3. Pursue peace. And so he says it again. Let's pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Linked again. Peace and edification, harmony and edification linked together. And, and so th there's something to that, that those two ideas belong together. And in other words, what the Bible is trying to tell us is when there's no peace, edification is important. The church can't grow. That's why edification, bottom line, edification is growth. It's spiritual growth and it's numerical growth. That's what it is. And if you don't have peace, you can't have growth. And that's how they're linked. Now, how are we going to grow? How are we going to grow a congregation in a way that pleases God? Well, I think the only way we can do that is to immerse ourselves in the Bible. That's what we have to do. Let's turn your Bibles. Let's look at several passages here. John chapter 6 for starters. While you're turning over there, I'll remind you of the context. Jesus had been feeding the multitudes, multiplying loaves and fishes and feeding multitudes of people. And then all at once Jesus stopped doing that. Because he realized that they were only coming for the loaves and the fishes. There's a lesson there in that for us today. You know, a lot of churches think that that's how they're going to grow. Let's just have loaves and fishes. Let's have food. Let's have dinners. Let's have playtime. Let's have ball teams. Let's have bowling leagues. And they think that's going to grow a church. <laughs> that's not how you grow a church, you see. And Jesus knew that, so he stopped feeding them. And that brings us down here to about verse 26 and 27. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs. In other words, not because you think I'm the Son of God. The signs were backing up and proving that he was the Son of God. So that's not why you're coming. But because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You're only coming for the food. You're only coming for the entertainment. That's why you're coming. Boy, there's a lesson in there for us today. We need to learn that. Churches need to learn that. Some churches of Christ need to learn that. And he says in verse 27, Don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. And he's talking about where we put our focus. Let's focus on the spiritual. Let's focus on the food that leads to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Labor for the food which leads to everlasting life. What is that food? What is it that's going to build us up and make us strong? Is it hot dogs and hamburgers? Is that going to make Walton Chapel strong? Hot dogs and hamburgers? Is a baseball team going to make Walton Chapel strong? Is a bowling league going to make Walton Chapel strong? No, none of those things. What's going to make Walton Chapel strong, what's going to make Walton Chapel grow, is immersion in the Word of God. Turn on out here to Acts chapter 20. And Paul said this very thing to the elders at Ephesus. You remember Paul we studied this not too long ago. Paul was leaving them. He'd been there for three years. And he was leaving and he called the elders to him and he gave his farewell address. And in the course of that discussion, in the course of that little time together, Paul said this in verse 32 to the elders. He said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, and here it is, which is able to build you up. <laughs> the Greek there is to edify you. That's what we're talking about, edification. And he says it's the word that's able to build you up. And it's the word that's able to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. You want to get strong spiritually? You want to grow numerically? Then you've got to immerse yourself in the word of God. 
That's what it takes. A church has to immerse itself in the Word of God. One more verse here, Ephesians 4. And in the context, Paul talking about unity, which that's our number one point there, harmony or unity. But then he talks about some of the things that are necessary to have that. In verses 11 through 16, he says, He himself, that's Jesus in the context, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. These were the things God gave, okay? God gave apostles, God gave prophets, God gave evangelists, pastors and teachers. There's one thing that all of those uh, individuals have in common. They're all teaching functions. Did you notice that? Apostles were teachers, prophets were teachers, evangelists are teachers, pastors are teachers, and teachers are obviously teachers. This is all teaching functions. Why did God give that? For the equipping of the saints. That's you all. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Stop, let that sink in for just a second. We sometimes, we get this narrow view that there's only one minister in the congregation. And in this one, that would be me. And this passage says, I'm actually equipping you for the ministry. Did you catch that? You're the minister. I'm equipping you for the work of, you're the ministers. You go out. You minister. You see, that's what that's saying here. Equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. You are the ministers. You do the work. For the edifying of the body. There's that word, edifying. Oh, look at there. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith. That's the gospel. That's the Bible. And the knowledge of the Son of God, that's a tall order. I ain't got there yet. I'm working on it, but I ain't got there yet. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The only way you're going to get there is to immerse yourself in the Scriptures. We have to do it individually at home, and we have to do it collectively as a church. Just immerse ourselves in the Scriptures, and then we'll grow. We'll grow spiritually, we'll grow stronger in the faith, and we'll grow numerically. Trust me, that will happen. And then he goes on that we should no longer be children. You can't stay babies. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. That's every member. Every joint is every member. According to the effective working by which every part does its share causes the growth of the body, and there's that word again, for the edifying of itself in love, edification. And it's only going to happen when we immerse ourselves in the Scripture. So we've seen from Acts 9 and verse 31, got to have peace, and we got to immerse ourselves in the Scripture. You want to grow, that's what it's going to take. But let's go back to Acts 9, let's notice something else. It says, walking in the fear of the Lord. Walking in the fear. In the fear of the Lord. The word fear here is talking about reverential fear. You're not talking about being scared to death of God. I think there's a place for that. It certainly is. Jesus said, don't fear him who can destroy the body but not destroy the soul. But fear him, be scared to death of him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. But there's also a reverential fear. And that's what I think Acts 9 is talking about. A reverential fear of God. Respect for God himself because of who he is. He's the creator of the universe. He's our redeemer. He's our judge. And there needs to be reverence for his word. Great respect for this word. This is not an ordinary book. This is not, this is not like some self-help book that you'd buy at the bookstore. This is God's own word. And there needs to be some reverence for that. Some reverence for God, the author of the book, and reverence for God himself. And so we've got to have reverence and we've got to live our lives with reverence. Turn your Bibles now to 1 Peter chapter 1. Because Peter talks about living a life of reverence, a life of godly fear. And in 1 Peter 1, verse 17, Peter says, If you call on the Father who without partiality judges each one's work, here it comes, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. You see what he just said there? This is how you live your lives. This is how you conduct yourself. This is every day. This is not just on Sunday. This is not just on Sunday and Wednesday. This is every day. Conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here. If you're here 20 years, if you're here 30 years, if you're here 70 years, however long you're here on this earth, conduct yourself in fear. Reverence. Why should I do that? Verse 18 tells us why knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold 
from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's why you need to have fear. Because the Lord himself came down here and died on the cross and shed his precious blood for you, and you should walk and conduct yourself in godly fear. Great reverence for God. And again, this is something that people can see in you. In your, in your daily actions, in the way you interact with people, in the way you talk with people, they can tell whether you actually revere God or not. You know, a lot of people put on a show and they show up at church, but then they go out and they live like the devil when they leave the church house. And so you're not conducting yourself with reverence. You're not conducting yourself with godly fear. Now, godly fear also brings itself into the church building because when we worship, there needs to be reverence and godly fear. Isn't that what Jesus really meant in John 4 and verse 24? When he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, we've got the truth nailed down pretty good. Yeah, got to sing, got to pray, got to lay by in store, got to take the Lord's Supper, have some tea. We've got the truth nailed down pretty good. But sometimes we lose sight of the spirit. That's the reverence. That's your spirit. Your spirit needs to be in the right frame of mind, so to speak. And that frame of mind is a mind of reverence. We've got to conduct our lives with reverence, and we've got to worship God with reverence. And again, that's something visitors pick up on immediately. They can tell if you're serious about worship. They look around the room, and they'll see whether you're uh, playing around with, your, with a game on your cell phone or whether you're actually reading the Bible. And visitors notice. They notice that. Do you really have fear? They see when you take the Lord's Supper, are, 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 is your mind on Jesus or is your mind somewhere else? People can tell. People, visitors can tell. And so they know whether or not you conduct yourself with fear. They know whether or not you worship in fear. And we have to have respect for God in our hearts, in our lives, and in our worship. And visitors can tell. They know. When they walk in the door, within five minutes, they can tell whether you all are serious or not about serving the Lord because they're watching. Believe it or not, they're watching. Well, let's go back to Acts 9. Let's notice something else. He says, Then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. There's that fourth thing right there, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We're promised the gift of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. Acts 2.38, remember that? Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's my conviction that different people have different ideas about what that gift is, but I think that gift is God's seal upon us. Let me show you why I think that. Turn over to Ephesians 1 and verse 13. In Ephesians 1 and verse 13, Paul says, in him, that's in Christ, in Christ you also trusted. And when did you do that? When did you trust in him? After you heard the word of truth. Isn't that what happened to the people on the day of Pentecost? They heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in case you wonder what that word of truth is, he says it's the gospel. In whom also having believed, isn't that what happened to the people on the day of Pentecost? They believed in Christ. And when you believed, he said, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit right there. God seals you. God puts his mark on you. God says, that one's mine. That belongs to me. That one's given himself to me. And I know who he is. And so that's, it starts right there when you obey the gospel. And we're taught, and that takes, remember that edification? We're taught that God wants to live in us. Not literally. We know God literally lives in heaven. But God wants to live in us. He wants to live through us. And, and, and that's, a, that's a motivator of sorts. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. For just a second. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was writing about the issue of fornication. And we get down here to verse 18, 19, 20. He says, flee sexual immorality, fornication, literally. Flee it, run away from it. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So when you commit fornication, you're not just sinning against God you're also sinning against your own body. Your body wasn't made for that. Your body wasn't made for fornication. You could, by the way, plug any sin in there. Your body wasn't made for drinking. Your body wasn't made for fornication. Your body wasn't made for homosexuality. Your body wasn't made for lying. It wasn't made for that. You're misusing the body. Now, right on the heels of that, verse 19, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? God wants to live in you. 
God wants to live in you. He's in you. And you have him from God, and you're not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, 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 glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. I don't want to take this temple that's meant for God to live in and, and give it over to profane use. And again, that's tied to the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure that I'm not dishonoring God by the way I'm living. That's what it boils down to. I want to make sure that the way I live honors God. That leads us to the fruit of the Spirit. Turn to Galatians 5. We spend a lot of time, rightly so, talking about the works of the flesh in verses 19 through 21. But we're not going to talk about them this morning. We're going to drop down to verse 22. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, notice the singular there, the fruit of the Spirit. I'm not sure there's any significance of that because there's a wide variety of fruit here. There's a wide variety of fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Do you realize what he just said? You can do this to your heart's content. You can, you can love, knock yourself out. Joy, have at it. Peace, dig in, enjoy. Long-suffering, have all you want. Kindness, have, you, there's no law against it. Do that all you want. Dig right in. Have at it, you see. And the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He's telling us how, how to live, how to conduct ourselves. And people pay attention. People pay attention. People are watching us. They see how we live. They know whether we respect God. They know whether we respect the Spirit of God. And the intercession of the Holy Spirit also comes into play. That brings us comfort, knowing that He uh, is praying for us. That's in Romans 8, 26 and 27. Paul says in those verses, Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. You ever been there? Haven't we all? Lord, I don't know how to say this, but you know what I mean. You know, well, how does the Lord know what you mean? Well, he tells you how. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The things I can't say, the things I can't get across, the things I can't put into word, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will get it in there. He'll get it over to the Father. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints. That comforts me. And the comfort of the Holy Spirit leads to respect for the Holy Spirit, leads to the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it leads to people seeing that in me. Now, the result of all this, this is just Acts 9, 31. The Bible says they were multiplied. They grew. They grew. And so what we've got right here is an outline, a perfect little outline in one little verse. You want to grow a church? There it is right there. There's your recipe right there. Now imagine an entire congregation with every single member working to exhibit these qualities. Imagine that. And then take that to the next level. Imagine the impact that might have on other people. Imagine the impact that might have on visitors. Imagine the impact you're going to have on people when you go out into the community and work and, and, and do business and, and do the things that you do with your friends and neighbors out there. And let me just bring this in as a personal story. I, I spent 16 years in Fishers, Indiana. Before that, 16 years at Hickory Grove. So I, I, I'm accustomed to staying a long time at a place. And when we were at Fishers, we grew quite a bit. When I first moved up there, we had about 70 souls. When I left, we had nearly 200. And whenever somebody came to place membership with the congregation, I was one of the elders. We'd always sit down. We didn't just say, come on in. We always have a sit-down conversation with the new members. Make sure that they're Christians. Make sure they're faithful. All that. So we sit down and have a conversation. And we always asked them, what drew you to this congregation? And every single time, I kid you not, every single time they said two things. Number one, the teaching that's done. <coughs> the teaching that's done. And number two, the friendliness of the members. They said it every single time. What I'm saying to you is every one of us have a stake in this. Every one of us have a, you want this church to grow, we all have a stake in it. Let's do these things. Let's have peace with one another. Let's immerse ourselves in the scripture and grow. Let's show reverence for God in the way we live our lives and in the way we worship. Let's rely on the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, I guarantee you we'll grow. 
We don't need to go on the internet and read articles about how to grow a church. We don't need to go to Amazon.com and buy a book written by a human being on how to grow a church. All we got to do is do this. Follow this. Hope the lessons helped you. And I hope it helps the church here to grow. That's what we're wanting to do. Take out your songbooks now and turn to the song of invitation. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, we encourage you to come to Jesus. And we want you to know, 294, that Jesus is still calling, just like the song says. How does he call? He calls through the gospel. He doesn't call through a feeling up and down your spine or a still small voice in the night. He calls through the gospel. And that gospel call has been echoing out for centuries. And it's coming to you today. You're here today for a reason. God allowed you to be here for a reason. He wanted you to hear this message for a reason. Maybe today's the day you need to obey the gospel. You ever thought about that? Maybe that's why God led you here. Maybe it's, it's time. It's time for you to believe in Christ, to repent of your sins, to confess that faith and be baptized. Right behind me, the baptistry is ready to go. And all we need is you. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?